Okay, so uh, welcome everybody at the first presentation of the Linux days this year. Um, I speak German, most of you probably speak German. Most of the Linux days are in English and I hope that's okay with, with everyone. Uh, so the first thing which we're gonna talk about Whatever. So the first thing which we're going to talk about in the Linux days is free and open source software. The real basics. Not really a lot of software per se going on today. Yeah. So this is an introduction to the concept, where it comes from, and why why it's totally right for you to be here. Why you should totally be interested in this topic. Okay. So moving on. Free and open source software. What does that mean? Free. The first. The first word in free and open source software. Uh, most of you might think it stands for free without cost. Um, and indeed, lots of free and open source software doesn't require you to pay for it. But free, as in free and open source software, is completely unrelated to price. This is very important because it's not about getting stuff for free. It's about having freedom inherent in the software. And um, the English language doesn't really have a way of specifying that, which makes it unambiguously different from free as in without any price. German does, French does, very many other languages do. Here in Switzerland, you have four official languages, every single one of which is more apt at, at describing freedom as a qualifier than English. So if you talk to your friends, your parents, you needn't use the English denominator free software. You can call it, uh, you can call it Freie software. That way it's clear that you're talking about free as in freedom and not free as in free beer. Second part, open source. This means that you can see the source of the software. This is what the source of a very simple program in C looks like. Yeah, um, Every software, when it's written, in the form in which the developer writes it, in the form in which reviewers, code reviewers can read it, and in the form in which other people can contribute to it, looks somewhat like this. There are dozens of different programming languages. All of them, not all of them, most of them contain letters which you can read. Yeah, this makes it easy for you to know what you're doing and for other people to collaborate with you. This makes what the software is doing obvious to the human. Uh, the software itself is not obvious to the human. The software itself is a collection of instructions for your machine, which you can technically not read. Uh, this is one way of showing what actual software looks like. This is actually a snippet, so a portion of the program, which was written here. Yeah. This program is translated into machine-readable re code by a process which is called comp uh, compilation. And then it looks something like what's behind me. This is called a hex dump. It's practically just showing the values of the bytes in hexadecimal values. And you can try to translate that to ASCII characters. You see that in the last part. But even so, it doesn't really make lots of sense to the human reader. Uh, which is why binary files, the things which actually run on your, com on your computer, don't make it easy for you to understand what's happening on your computer. In order to do that, you would need the source code. Yeah? And, um, yeah. So this is practically one of the reasons why, uh, why open source is a special thing about software, because normally when you execute something, it just looks like this. Yeah? And you might not think that there are scripting languages, languages where you just type something in the command line and so on, and that gets executed that also doesn't execute directly the line from the command line. Like scriptable languages just generally have access to pre-compiled binaries on your system. Everything on your computer at the actual level looks something like this. Okay, so uh, how did we get to free and open? Why did these things start to matter about software? So let's look a bit at how software evolved. Uh, at the beginning, in the early days of software development, softwares were huge, uh, in the early days of yeah, software and hardware development, of computer development, computers were huge machines. Yeah? And uh, most of the people who worked with computers were actually quite apt at computing. They were the people who developed them, they were people who knew a lot about them, and uh, the software wasn't necessarily that complicated. So this mix mixture of people who are, by definition, technically apt, just because they work with these primitive machines, and the fact that software was quite simple led to the fact that users always, has, always had an access and an understanding of the source code of all programs. Yeah? In the early days of software, free and open wasn't necessarily something which would stand out. Yeah? Uh, this started becoming an issue and a plus a bit later. Uh, later, while after computers started developing more and more, software and hardware started to diverge. They started to become separate. Uh, 
at the core of it, this is a good development because in the end, if all hardware came bundled with its software, even if it were open source, that would be uncompetitive, which is one of the rulings of the of, of some United States court against IBM. Yeah, um, bundled software is anti-competitive, and that's important. Um, that's like one of the first events which paved the way for the emergence of software companies. Companies which no longer produced hardware and threw in some code so you can do something with it, but, pro but companies which practically developed software for you to use with your hardware wherever it might be from, or maybe not wherever it might be from, but like in addition to the actual hardware you bought. Um, and since software became a product, became important for them to make sure that they can sell the product, so that people can't just take this product and distribute it or modify it, make it better without their consent, say, sell it for more money, less money, whatever. And uh, the first measures which they started taking were purely technical. As I've shown you, there's a difference in between the software code with which developers, companies, and so on work with, and the actual binaries which run on your computer, yeah? If you just distribute the binaries, then you're practically leaving the user in the dark. He doesn't know exactly what's going on. Uh, he can't really modify it or make it better. And this was one of the measures with which early software companies tried to keep control of their product, yeah? And uh, the biggest coup, so to say, well, not necessarily the biggest coup, the biggest uh, fortune which software companies found, at least in the early days, uh, was a ruling which said that software is patentable. Before this ruling, in 1980, you could not really obtain software patents. Yeah? Uh, software patents would have been, software would have been considered more like an, uh, like, an, like an idea, like something which you cannot get a patent on, something which you can maybe get recognition for, you can have authorship on, but not something you can really patent. And ever since that has happened, uh, software companies have had a plethora of methods to make sure their code stays theirs, they have the control, they can sell it to you for however much you're willing to pay for it, um, and pretty much leave you in the dark. And this didn't sit well with some people. And uh, the first people who started worrying about this, very actually, very early actually in the developments of, of, of these things, in the early 80s, were the people of the Free Software Foundation. Uh, mainly a guy called Richard Star uh, Stallman from MIT. And um, the worry was that this entire system where companies finally had the possibility to, to get patents on their software, needless to say, they had the possibilities to just give you binaries, files which you didn't really understand, this would lead to a world where software was completely closed. It would be a completely locked-in system where if you weren't one of the companies, if you didn't have like patent contracts with them, you couldn't really help develop the software world. You couldn't help make it better, you couldn't understand it. The fear was that software would probably become a walled concept where outsiders, people who weren't in the big companies, wouldn't have any access to. This was the biggest worry. And this worry prompted some people to, to form this Free Software Foundation, which promotes universal, universal freedom to study, distribute, create, and modify computer software. Exactly the things which wouldn't have been possible in such a world system, and exactly the things which many people would consider very important. Yeah? Uh, the Free Software Foundation also promotes lots of social activism in the sense that they say, okay, um, free software is a basic freedom or should be a basic freedom. Uh, you have a moral obligation to use free software because if you're not using free software, then you're practically feeding the system which, which is making the world a worse place and so on. Uh, at the core, they're very moral, they're very ethical. You can look at their, their website. They like to preach a lot. Some of you might agree with that, actually. Uh, some of you might not. Some people consider the Free Software Foundation a bit dogmatic in the sense that they, they don't treat free freedom as a tool but they treat freedom more of as a god. So it's not that freedom is good because we can do something good with it, but no, freedom is good by definition. That's why we have to impose it everywhere. Um, in contrast to that, you would have the Open Source Initiative. This is another organization, considerably smaller than the Free Software Foundation, which was formed a bit later. Uh, it was formed mainly by people who had an idea of software, but also of business, and who realized that the ideas of free and open source software can help make the world a better place in a sense which is a bit more detached from ethics and morals and so on, in the sense that they could also help make the, the world a better place for software companies. They could help create better products, they could help grow the software industry, they could be profitable for companies like Netscape or Google and so on, and uh, practically the open source initiative set out 
to um, to militate for these concepts, not necessarily at an ethical level to the public, to students. The Free Software Foundation is mainly active at universities, but also to companies, to people who traditionally would have been outraged by free and open source, and to show that it's actually good, but it's good for everyone. Yeah? And uh, to a certain extent, the open source initiative rebranded the free software movement. Yeah? They said, okay, this free software identity of the Free Software Foundation is a bit too confrontationalist. It might bore some people out of their minds because who cares about these complicated morals? We just want to get this, this job done. Uh, so they decided to invent a new term, open source, yeah? and to, to propagate it. And it, it won a lot of traction. It's hard to say what exactly in the current world is mainly thanks to, to the open source initiative, but we can see that nowadays many companies starting not necessarily moving to open source, but adapting open source and indirectly also free and open source into their business model. Yeah? Um, I try to present these as like two, two, two competing ideas, open source and free. Uh, as in the Open Source Initiative and the Free Software Foundation. But at the end of the day, they're not even two sides of the same coin. At the end of the day, they're the same thing. They're completely identical. It's just that they're also completely different, uh, which is why we usually refer to FOSS, which means free and open source software. I like to call it free and or open source software, but whatever. Uh, FOSS is the unified name for both of these tendencies. You can say soft freedom, as in free software is important to you because you want a free world, everybody has access to everything and so on. Or you could say, oh, I have a company or I plan to make a startup and I want to have a good product and I know open source can do the job. And in the end of the day, the projects which run free or open source software run both. Okay, now what exactly is like the concrete manifestation of free and open source and all of these things? Like maybe it's been a bit too abstract but uh, it's actually very concrete because in a world where you have copyright laws, you have to be very specific about what, uh, what your ideas entail. And one way to define, okay, my project is open source is over licenses. It's actually the main way. And there are a great number of licenses for free and or open source software, yeah? Uh, the main license, one of the first licenses, the most important license, a license which is very much pushed by the Free Software Foundation is the GPL license. Uh, it's the GNU General Public License. Yeah? And it's based on the four freedoms of the software, Free Software Foundation. The freedom to run the program as you wish for any pro purpose. Um, you don't have this freedom with most proper proprietary software. The freedom to study how the program works so ch and changes so that it does your computing as you wish. You can be certain that you don't have this freedom with most proprietary software. Uh, the freedom to, re re to redistribute copies so that you can help your neighbor, which means you can take the software and you can give it to like the next person on the left. Uh, the freedom to distribute copies of your modified versions to others, meaning that you can take the software, you can modify it, and then it can pass down to each neighbor to your left. Um, this is the base of the GPL. And uh, it's the license which people would attribute more to the Free Software Foundation corner of the movement. Uh, another very important license is the BSD license, yeah? Uh, the BSD license is the main license for the Berkeley softly, software distribution, or at least that's where it started. Now it's used everywhere in the free software world. And many people actually would recommend this license over other free and, and or open source licenses. Uh, this license is very permissive. It has three clauses which are incredibly simple. Um, redistributions of source code must retain the above copyright notice, this list of conditions and the following disclaimer. Yeah? Meaning that you can't just take the software and strip the license, put some other license on it and say, ooh, now I have a new, now I have a new license which fits me on the software. Uh, redistributions in binary form must reproduce the above copyright notice, this list of conditions and the following disclaimer in the documentation and or other materials provided with the distribution. Meaning you don't get to cheat. You don't get to get away with just distributing the binary and say, well, a license doesn't fit into the binary, so bye bye license. Um, neither the name of the copyright holder nor the names of its contributors may be used to endorse or promote products derived from the software without specific prior written permission. Uh, sounds a bit complicated, the last one, but um, it's actually quite important, especially if you're using software for critical applications. And um, free software projects are usually so big, they have so many contributors yeah, over time, uh, and they evolve. 
And the people might misuse the name of one of the first contributors to say, oh, okay, this guy thinks that everything I've done with the software ever since is a good idea. No. Uh, so you don't get to do that. These are the only things which you, you don't get to do with the, with the Berkeley software distribution. You can see it's a lot more permissive than the GPL. It's a lot more free in the sense that um, it doesn't really impose many conditions on you. It's a bit less free in the sense that it guarantees less freedoms in the long run. Uh, copyleft is not a license, yeah? So the two licenses which we talked about are the GPL and the, the BSD license, license smart over. Uh, the copyleft is a key concept of very many licenses, yeah? So a license can be copyleft or it cannot be copyleft, or maybe it can't really be a bit copyleft. Uh, so it's like a yes or no thing, yeah? The first license which we talked about, the GPL, especially in its latest incarnation, GPL ver version three, is definitely a copyleft license. BSD is definitely not a copyleft license. Uh, other license families such as Creative Commons, you might know that from artwork or whatever else. And some, some of my pictures here, uh, yeah, for instance, you have this copyright notice here. The CC stands for Creative Commons. It's one of the most popular licenses, not for software, but it's an open source license or open source, a free license for art. And um, Creative Commons gives you the op option. Are, are you going to choose a copyleft license of ours or no, a non-copyleft license of ours? Uh, copyleft is a thing which is a bit controversial in the free software world in that some people would say that's the best thing that ever happened in the free software world, and some people would say it's like the worst thing that ever happened in the, free, in the software world. Like Richard Stallman might, for instance, tell you it's the greatest thing ever, and uh, Steve Ballmer is known for saying that it's the absolutely worst thing ever and it's going to ruin software forever. Uh, I'd, I'd like to think that I'm quite different from both of these point of views. I don't know really if it's a bad thing. And I'll tell you what the key points are in the discussion of copyleft, yeah? So copyleft practically says that the software has to forever stay free. Any copy of it or any modified version of it, which you redistribute, has to guarantee the same freedoms as the original, yeah? Uh, it sounds like a really great thing. Uh, in a way, the reason why some people think it's so great is because it turns freedom into something viral. If you have a really great thing, which is copyleft, then everybody who would ever want to use that great thing must guarantee freedom in their products. Yeah? Uh, some licenses, some versions of copyleft licenses even restrict in how far you are allowed to use copyleft products together with products which are not copyleft, most notably the GPL3. Um, when the Free Software Foundation moved most of their stuff to GPL3, very many companies which had proprietary software and like non-free software by definition have to, had to move their products away from their compiler and so on. Uh, the bad thing about this, yeah, is that it's only a great idea, like keeping, uh, keeping everything free forever is only a great idea if you can be certain that freedom in the world of software is guaranteed to forever be useful. Yeah, whatever we're ever going to want to do with software, we're going to be able to do it under the auspices of a free software world. Yeah, and it, it's a reasonable assumption to make, but you can't really know for sure. So in a way, licensing stuff under copyleft, which I do because I use very many things. For instance, you've seen the first picture in this presentation is on a copyleft license, meaning that I have to license this presentation under a copyleft license. Yeah? So using copyleft is a bit like locking yourself outside of jail. It seems like a great idea because why would you want to be in jail? But who knows, maybe at some point you want to go back there for something. Huh? <sighs> yeah, so maybe the most important part of the evening maybe I should have brought it up earlier, you know, are the advantages of free and open source software. Why should you care? I mean, okay, one of the points is you might care because you're, uh, you're a very deeply ethical human being and you care about freedom and so on, and then the Free Software Foundation discussion already was enough to, to like keep your eyes open. But uh, you, you might not care much about that. You might care about other things. And free and open source software has a lot of other advantages except being good. Yeah? Um, in a moral way. It has advantages of, of, it has the advantage of being very good in the software way, yeah? Uh, free and open source software tends to perform quite well, yeah? And the key for this, the sort of mantra of the free and open source world is given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. Think about how some proprietary software is developed. Maybe don't think of Windows. Windows is like a classical example and has a huge company with thousands of employers behind it, but think of a smaller, 
uh, proprietary product. Yeah, think of something like, uh, I don't know, Mathematica, MATLAB, I keep thinking of scientific software because I'm a scientist, but you might be thinking of something else. Uh, they don't have such huge companies as Microsoft. They have somewhat smaller companies. They don't have so many people on the projects. They have maybe 10, 20 people on the projects. And uh, these are the people who are allowed to see the code. Yeah, but It's not open source. Other people can see the code, meaning that it's just the developers and maybe some other testers which they put on the project which can look at the code and be critical. With free and open source software, anybody can look at the code. Let's say you're a talented computer scientist and you stumble upon something which is interesting, you take a look at the code. Let's say you're not a computer scientist, you run the program and you see there's a typo in the interface and you see where the code is written and you write that guy's a notice, listen guys, you've missed this typo, yeah? So all these little bugs or huge bugs, the chance of them being improved is just so much, so much larger. So you get less crashes in free and open source software. People who've used Linux and Windows will be able to tell you about this. I'm able to tell you about this. You get better benchmark performance, especially in older hardware or in hardware which is not so good. For instance, I, I run a Raspberry Pi at home. I don't know if you guys know that it's like a microcomputer. It would be really hard to try to put uh, Microsoft Windows 7 on that, yeah? But with Ubuntu or like even more minimal Linux distributions, it runs, it runs like a breeze, yeah? old laptops and so on tend to run very well under Linux. And even if it fails, yeah, even if you try to install Ubuntu on your computer or perhaps an even better Linux distribution and uh, something breaks and you're like, oh my God, why is this broken? You've lied to me, free and open source software isn't that good. Uh, then the support is so much better, yeah? I mean, you can try calling Microsoft for, for support and you're gonna be like, oh, did you try to like uh, turn off and turn on your computer and so on? Whereas if you have a problem with free and open source software, usually the people who write it, because it's open, they identify with it, yeah? And the people who you get to talk to if you, if you write a complaint, and if you go on their IRC channel or if you post on their mailing list or if you go on their forum, or if you go directly on the development page, which you can do even if you're even if you're not a programmer, then the people you get to talk to are the people who actually wrote this. Yeah, they're the people who know what's going on, and the help you're going to be able to get is so much better. Even if you're not a programmer, for instance, I'm not a programmer. When I first started with Linux, I started with a very complicated Linux distribution. Yeah, and I ran into a lot of issues, uh, but they all got solved really quick simply because the support was so extraordinary. Empowerment, yeah? Uh, this is a very interesting aspect of free and open source software. Very many people don't realize how important this is, yeah? I and mean, you might realize that it's important to not have a vendor lock-in, like you say, have, for instance, with very many Apple products. Um, some people might realize that it's important to have some control over services running on your system because you always get that really annoying pop-up which asks you to update, yeah? It'd be really great if you could like turn it off, like, forever, well, in, in free and open source software, you can, yeah? Um, but there's also very many aspects, like even to these things, especially control over any service running on your system. There's just a lot more aspects than that one pop-up, which you see, because there's a lot of things which are out of your control on your system, which you don't see, yeah? Uh, for instance, processes, which are wasting memory just because someone at Microsoft thinks it's good to check for something every five minutes. Or, um, or processes which can funnel your personal information to outside sources. We'll get to that in a second, but it's also a question of empowerment. It's not just that you lose your privacy, but you also lose your computing power alongside with it, yeah? Doesn't make any sense. Um, but there's also aspects which people tend to miss entirely. Uh, become smarter and more creative. You're not used to doing whatever on earth you want with your software, yeah? You're just not used to doing that because you're using software which was made by a user interface developer who thought, okay, we're gonna make Microsoft Word. What do I think that the user wants to do, okay? And these people aren't necessarily stupid. They're very good, I, I believe, some of them at what they're doing. They're doing like market studies. They're asking users and so on. But in the end, it's someone else who decides, who draws the line and says, okay, out of everything we've heard, we want our users to be able to do this, 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 and this, and we're gonna make menus for this, not much else. Or maybe we're gonna add a few menus later on. You're not used to saying, okay, I want a text processor which I can program to do whatever on earth I want, yeah? You're not used to that. But using free and open source software, again, even if you're not a programmer, which I, for instance, am not, allows you to learn that you should be able to do with your software whatever you want. 
Um, should I give you an example? I can't think of any simple examples. Hmm. Um, uh, maybe, how many of you are scientists? Mm. Okay, let's, let's try this. So for instance, usually when you make a scientific paper, yeah? Uh, you make your figures in MATLAB or whatever else, and then you save them somewhere, and then you copy they, them into your document, and then you have a nice figure. Yeah? Um, but nobody really thinks much about this, because this is what you've learned to do, because this is what the user interface developer of MATLAB thought. Okay, people want to be able to save figures, right? Right. Uh, what if what, if what I want to do is not to save figures? What if I don't want this file to be somewhere just for me to copy it and to put it in my document? What if I want my document to take the data and turn them into a graphic so that every time I, I change my data, the document changes. What if I want to do that? What if I don't want to re-export the figure from MATLAB and drag it into PowerPoint and whatever else every time something changes in my data? Every time I think, oh, I should have taken the mean and not the median. I don't know, do you guys understand this? Okay, maybe a bit, then I'm gonna try to wrap it up. Well, the, th the thing is you can do this with free and open source software. You can do this with LaTeX, which is the text processor I'm using right here, and you can do this with Python and its toolkits, which, um, which is a programming language which can do most of the things which MATLAB can do. Yeah, so it works, yeah? Like for instance, my entire master's thesis, I remembered a couple of days before I had to hand it in. Hmm, okay, I forgot to add this participant to the data, yeah? It would have been a lot of work if I had to like re-export all of my figures. I didn't, and my tables, I didn't. I just put it into the folder, recompiled my LaTeX document again, and boom, everything's up to date. So this is just an example of things you wouldn't really even think of doing if you're trained to, to like listen to the user interface instead of saying, okay, I want to do the things which I think are cool. And of course you get better software habits. Uh, there's this bad stereotype in a way that uh, Linux is for nerds, yeah? Um, it's also for nerds. And this is a really great thing. Uh, not only is it also for nerds, but it's mainly made by nerds. It's made by people who understand software and who want to use the software which they themselves make. It's made by people who have an idea what on earth is going on on this computer. Yeah? And the software which such people tend to use is the software which tends to be efficient and which tends to let you use the computer in a way in which it's meant to be used, in a way in which the, the, the simple nature of the computer makes it conductive for you to use it. Yeah? So practically by using the software which nerds tend to use, you might not become a nerd but you might gain some of the software affinity of nerds, yeah? You might realize that saving all of your spreadsheets in XLS is completely, utterly nonsensical. You might realize that you should just save them in comma-separated values because it does the same thing, just removes all the clutter. Uh, or you might learn that, uh, I mean, you're expecting to use Office applications, PowerPoint, Word, these things which move your student life. You, you might ask yourself at some point, why? Why do I need these? I can do everything which I can do with them with LaTeX and I can do it better. Okay, sustainability. That's like a very big point of, uh, of the alternative, which is the, the organization of ours which uh, organizes the Linux days, yeah? Digital sustainability. It's a very interesting thing. Normally when you think of sustainability, you think about uh, trees and, and hippies and people who don't want people to hunt seals and so on. Uh, Digital sustainability is not about that. Digital sustainability is about the fact that in the same way in which we'd like to keep the environment safe for future generations to use, we would like to keep our software safe for future generations to use. And one of the ways to do that is the copyleft way in which you guarantee that the software and all of its derivatives will forever stay free and blah, blah, blah. Uh, but um, there's also other details in the design of free and open source which make it so incredibly sustainable. There is no single entity on which the future of software depends. Imagine tomorrow, I don't know, a bomb went off at some Microsoft headquarters. Everybody dead. Huge tragedy for them, their families, many other people, also for you if you're using Windows because that was it, yeah? Uh, no more support, no more new versions. You're on your own, yeah? Um, if that, if something happened to the data centers, wherever they might keep their source code, even if someone wanted to take up the, the baton and bring Microsoft into the next decade, they would not. Um, because there wouldn't be any source code. Yeah? With free and open source software, the source code is everywhere. It's in their repositories, it's on their computers, it's on my computers, it's on someone else's computers who was just curious and downloaded it. 
whatever happens, if anybody at any point will think this software is a good idea and will want to continue developing it, that software will stay alive forever. Yeah? Uh, everybody can make it better, nobody can make it worse. Maybe you should take like the second part of that with a grain of salt, but it's true. Yeah? Free and open source software is versioned so that you can tra keep track of who changed what and so on. Um, meaning that nobody can really make it worse. Someone makes a bad modification, who cares? The previous code is still there. Uh, but anybody can make it better. Yeah? You have a good idea, go on and edit it. If you don't know how to edit it, though usually editing code, you've seen it's, it's just text, it's quite easy, you can just uh, tell someone who can. Yeah? You can also make it better, indirectly, as it were. And of course, software which is free and open is reproducible and transparent. Uh, in the same way in which science is reproducible and transparent. So it's transparent in the sense that you can see what went on there, and it's reproducible in the sense that you can check, okay, if I take the same code, compile it on my machine, run it on my machine, will I get the exact same thing which these guys got? You can make sure that it's not a glitch, it's not a coincidence, they're not lying to you, this is what the software does. Yeah? Uh, it's also important because software so much knowledge goes into software, so many ideas, how do I sort this list, how do I solve this problem, how do I calculate something. A lot of knowledge goes into the creation of software. Yeah? Same as in science, yeah? finding out stuff about nature, so much knowledge. And uh, if you don't keep it open and transparent, and if you don't always check to make sure that it's reproducible, this knowledge will be lost. Yeah? Like science, good science is by definition reproducible and transparent. It does science, engineering, do great things while being reproducible and being transparent. You can also do great things, amazing things, things which people could never believe could have been done while being irreproducible and intransparent. Yeah? That's called magic. So if, if you're running proprietary software on your computer, your computer is magic in the worst possible sort of way. Yeah? It's alchemy, whereas free and open source software it's in a certain way science. Security. Many people might be concerned about this, especially about the, um, uh, after the developments with Edward Snowden, NSA, SPNR scandals. Maybe that's what brought some of you here. Yeah? Uh, maybe you decided, okay, I don't know who's looking at my data. I don't know who's checking out my emails, and I heard that open source is a solution to that. I'm gonna come to this presentation and see what it's all about, maybe. Maybe that's you. Um, and in that case, I can say, uh, yeah, you're right. Uh, free and open source software excels at privacy because people can look at what's happening there and if anything bad is happening there, anybody can blow the whistle. Yeah? You might also be the kind of person who goes like, won't these hippies shut up? It's okay, I don't really care, I'm not doing anything wrong. Um, you might even be uh, disinclined to join Linux presentations because you think someone's gonna bore you for two hours about how the NSA is spying on you. And in that case, I can also say, yeah, actually, uh, to a certain degree, I agree. Yeah? Privacy is not the backbone of free and open source, but privacy is one of the many things at which free and open source excels, simply because the concept is so good and so solid. Practically, the extraordinary performance in terms of privacy and free, of free and open source software uh, it's like saying, yeah, the free and open source software movement took it on with the most malicious elements in the world's most influential security agencies and it won, or at the very least it put up a good fight. So yeah, that's how good we are. Uh, transparency. We already had this before. But transparency is also very important in the sense of security. So in the sense in which you would like your government to be transparent. You would like to know how decisions are made how does this process go on? No? Uh, and there, free and open source software excels as well because everybody can see how a decision, let's say you have a diagnostic software and so on, uh, how a decision is made by the software. No? Um, it's also very important to know how things are archived, how things are stored by the software so that you can rely on it, so that you can know this software will not let me down. This software will do what I tell it to do. And if you're using software to aid you in decisions, especially in political decisions, this is very important. Some people talk about electronic voting, like on voting computers. Uh, my, some people might say that's a good idea, some people might say that's a bad idea, but regardless of whether or not it's a good idea or not, if you'd ever have voting computers, they would have to be open source. 
because if they are not, then you can never check. The population at large can never check and say, okay, we're gonna accept this. This is really our voice which is mediated by these computers because they wouldn't know. Not, not just the population at large, but no, no large part of the population. What the reason why democratic voting is so stable and it's so hard for people to, uh, to cheat on it is that you would need to coordinate a huge effort to like move all of these ballots and fake them and so on. You need thousands of people to like falsify an election. It'd be the same with free and open source voting computers, yeah? Because you would need a lot of people to be able to develop a product which is malicious and to be able to make sure that nobody else comes to the idea that it could be malicious. And the last part, why uh, free and open source software is so amazing for security is encryption, yeah? Uh, you want to make sure your data is really encrypted. You want to make sure nobody built, in a, back, built a back door into it. Uh, and encryption standards are developed by scientists, by people who like professionally study encryption and how you can encrypt things and decrypt them and so on. Uh, and uh, so free and open source software goes hand in hand with the reproducibility and transparency of science in this aspect. Yeah? You might have heard like NSA, the NSA built in a backdoor and whatever encryption standard, but you can be sure if encryption standards wouldn't have been free and open source, <laughs> these backdoors would be teeming anyway. Okay, examples of a free and open source software. Like we've heard a lot about why this is great, why this is interesting, but what exactly is open source? Like can we find some examples of that? The most prominent example of open source software is probably the Linux kernel, yeah? Most people call the operating system, which we will talk about in, in the next couple of weeks, days, um, Linux, like Ubuntu Linux or Fedora Linux or Gentoo Linux and so on. Um, that's just the kernel. That's the part of the software, with, the part of the computer prob practically which, which interfaces with the hardware drivers and so on. Yeah? That's the Linux kernel. This is the mascot of the Linux kernel, the penguin, which you will see on our handouts and outside of the door. Uh, and this kernel was made by, uh, by Linus Torvalds, a Finnish student at that time who was doing it like as part of his university research. He thought it'd be a nice idea to put like a, a Linus spin on Unix, which he did which turned out to be a very good idea, mainly because he decided to license it in a free and open source way. He still works on it. He's still the single biggest contributor in Linux. If you look at the current code of Linux, he wrote under 5% of it, yeah? So he started it, it bears his name, but it would never have been such a huge thing without free and open source concepts. Uh, the GNU Linux operating system. This is actually the proper name of the operating systems which we might show to you the next couple of days. The reason why it's called GNU Linux is because calling it Linux gives you the impression that Linus wrote this kernel and everybody else then said, oh, let's do open source with this kernel and build like everything around the kernel. This is actually not how it happened. The, the Free Software Foundation founded the GNU project, which made a lot of software components in the effort of trying to create an operating system which does not lock you in forever, yeah? And they had many things. They had a compiler, they had other pieces of software, they didn't have a kernel. So practically the idea is the, the GNU project and the GNU operating system came first and the Linux kernel was the part which finally made it whole and functioning and so on. Um, the GNU project is still developing their own kernel but since Linux is so good, people mostly forgot about that. Uh, but it also develops so many other things. It develops the GNU compiler collection which most open source Operating system will use, will use to compile the software in your computer from the code text which I showed you into that like hard to read machine readable text. GNOME, it's a desktop environment which many people of you might use, which if you install the distribution which we recommend, I think you, you might end up using. Um, but also very many other pieces of software. GNU Octave, it was meant to be like an open source, free and open source variation of MATLAB. Uh, it can compile MATLAB files, it can read MATLAB files, it can do everything that MATLAB can do. It does not have a graphical user interface. Uh, GNU Cache, it's, um, it's an open source, uh, free and open source software for managing finances. Like if you're not a big company and you don't like really seriously need SAP, you can probably do everything with GNU Cache, yeah? It works for people. I manage my finances with GNU Cache. Uh, it works for small companies as well. But there's also so much more. Like many people of you, if you're thinking about switching to Linux, would be wondering, well, will I be able to do everything which I can do uh, with my Windows computer with Linux? 
And the answer is, yes, you can, though you shouldn't try to do the same things, but yes, you can. Every application which you use in Windows will have some sort of alternative in the free and open source world. Yeah? You have lots of desktop applications. Chromium, it's a browser. Many of you might actually be using it on Windows because it's such a great browser. Firefox, do, do I stop? Do I go on? Do you guys want to break? No, not bored? Yeah, are you still entertained? Okay. Uh, Firefox, which is a browser best known for the fact that you used it a couple of years ago. Uh, LibreOffice, which is an office suite, which allows you to do the same things which you shouldn't be doing with Word and Excel and PowerPoint under Windows, if you uh, under Linux, if you really want to. Uh, LaTeX, which is a piece of software, which is what you should actually be doing to process your text. Uh, it, there's lots of multimedia applications under Linux in the free and open source world. Uh, MPV, MPD, you might not know these. There are really good applications for playing videos. For instance, MPV is a video player without a visual interface. You might go like, what? But you don't really need one, right? You just need to see the video. You already have your keyboard for forward, backward. Why do you need a visual interface for that? Uh, MPD, it's a music player daemon, which allows you to separate where your music comes from from where you're listening to it. For instance, I'm listening to music on my phone from my Raspberry Pi, which I told you about, which is at home. Uh, GMPC is a player for that, that music player daemon, and VLC is uh, a software which you also might already be using on Windows, simply because it's so good. It's a video player, this time with a graphical interface. Uh, scientific software. It's pro probably what I personally care about most, so I'll try to not go into any detail because you might not. Um, practically, there's so much scientific software in the free and open source world because free and open source grows in the same way in which science grows, yeah? Uh, and traditionally, most scientists tended to use like MATLAB and Mathematica and uh, there are a couple of other things and some might still use them today, but SciPy, NumPy, uh, matplotlib, NiPy, this is neuroimaging for Python, have boomed in the last year, simply because scientists are realizing, wow, this is the same way in which I'm, con I'm conducting my research. Why would I not be conducting my software behavior in the same mode? Jabref is it's a manager for references. You might know EndNote, which allows you to reference, uh, to manage references in Microsoft Word, which is something you shouldn't be using in the first place. Uh, Jabref allows you to, to manage your references, for instance, for LaTeX. Yeah? Question. R. R, yes, I should have put R there. I think the reason why I didn't is, uh, is because I told you this is what I care about most. So, like some people might have like really profound feelings when they're talking about the privacy part. This is where I had profound feelings and I really don't like the R syntax. So I try to not use R, so I forgot to put it there. But yeah, R. Um, even if many scientists traditionally use MATLAB, uh, MATLAB is okay for statistics. It's not as good as R. Even now, after MATLAB has developed for a while, even now after SciPy and NumPy and so on have boomed, R is still the single best package for statistics you can ever, ever find. The syntax is really ugly if you ask me, but it's really good. Yeah? Uh, another area where free and open source software excels uh, is the server and cloud area of software application. Yeah? We'll get to this in one of the next slices, but, uh, slides, but um, most of the servers you use, you know, run on open source software, yeah. Apache is one of the, it's the, the mostly used um, software, uh, server software. OpenStack, ah, the S should have been capital. Yeah, so it's OpenStack with a capital S, uh, is, um, is a software for managing uh, virtual cluster servers. The University of Zurich uses it to manage its computing cluster, like the past one, the whatever, and the new one, the science cloud. Uh, WordPress. Some of you might have blogs, some of you might have had blogs which use WordPress, but so many more. Uh, graphics, like if you're a photographer or an artist or whatever, you, you, you don't really have to worry, yeah? Uh, raw therapy, if you've ever heard about it, is the best software for men, okay. Is in my opinion, the best software for managing uh, raw data from your camera. I'm a, uh, I'm a photo enthusiast, there's my camera back there. Wave to my camera. Yeah, okay. Uh, and I manage all of my uh, all of my raw files with raw therapy. It has so many ways of like balancing your colors, playing around with the sensor, adjusting everything to your sensor. It's just genius. GIMP, the GNU image manipulation program, I think it's called, um, is practically like Photoshop, and 
paint and image viewer, except it's not bad at all and it's quite good for, for the free and open source world. Inkscape, it's a bit like Corel Draw. I don't know if they even make Corel Draw anymore. See? There's a thing of, uh, about uh, software depending on one, on one particular company. If Corel Draw would have been open source, I would have known that it's still out there somewhere. Okay. Um, great. So now that I've told you why, what exactly is open source software, let's see who uses it. So I told you about this in the last slides, when, a slide when we we're talking about server and cloud infrastructures. The internet uses free and open source software, yeah? So you might be thinking, okay, free and open source is quite obscure. I'm a really interested student. I'm gonna join this presentation because I wanna find out more about it, but most of the world probably doesn't use it, doesn't know about it. Well, uh, guess again, yeah? Most of the internet runs on it. The first pie chart you see are the like software pieces which operate the server, yeah? And separated out are the ones which are not free, yeah? So Apache is free software. Nginx, I'm not, I'm not a networking, Nginx, yeah, I'm not a networking person. I don't know how these things are pronounced. Um, it's also free and open source software. Uh, there's a couple of, uh, of uh, servers running Microsoft IIS, whatever that stands for, and other, and other server management software, which is non-free. But as you can see already here, over three quarters of the server <coughs> world is open source. And the servers themselves, the websites, the operating system of, of their websites. Again, Windows has a surprising market share here of almost a third. But um, yeah, most websites rely on an operating system, which is free and open source, mostly. OK, public institutions, yeah? Another big user of uh, a free and open source software, probably not as big as it should be, especially in the Western world where political governments feel very cushy because the software companies are here in the Western world. So if anything goes wrong, well, we're the government. We kind of still have the upper hand. Uh, but uh, outside of the Western world, very many, very many governments switch to free and open source. Yeah, In India, in Brazil. Uh, but even in the Western world, very many cities, Yeah, for some reason, city of Munich changed all of its public computers to, to free and open source. In Germany, I think it's a big thing. I don't know why. Maybe the Germans like really like free and open source. Um, but also educational institutions. Yeah, these are pr probably the prime example. And here an example which is relevant to you because if you're here, you're most likely studying at one of these two. Uh, so the ETH has a cluster which runs on Linux. I think it was Fedora or something. Huge cluster runs on Linux, uh, and it also has Fedora dual boot on all its public computers. So if you're using a public computer of the, at the ETH, you can te technically have your pick in between Windows or free and open source. Uh, and the University of Zurich, as I already told you, has two computing clusters. Uh, both of which I've used. The first one, Math. The second one, really good. I've heard. Um, and they both use Linux, yeah? and they both uh, use OpenStack, which is free and open source. Businesses, yeah? so maybe in the first part of the presentation, I tried to make this obvious, but maybe, just maybe, it wasn't obvious enough. Yeah? Free and open source is not about confronting business. It's not about saying, hey, you capitalists, we're socialists, we're gonna do things different and better, no. Uh, free and open source is something which works for the entire world. And businesses have realized this, and very many businesses are incorporating, at least in part, open source into the things that which they are doing. One example would be Google, uh, widely known as a company which promotes free and open source, but their browser, which is probably one of the products from Google which you use the most, is open source. Yeah, uh, you have the first version, this one, Chromium, which is the open source project. And the second version, this is Chrome, which is Google's project, yeah? So practically what Google is doing, the way in which they're benefiting from open source is that they have a product which they can use to bring to their users, to collect statistics about their users or whatever else makes Chrome interesting for them. And they want this product to be really good, yeah? Uh, but it's, you can't really manage closed source software to be that good. So the decision was we're gonna make this A, a good product, and B, we're gonna make it easy on us, or at least I assume it was easy on them, um, by making it open source. Yeah, The source of Chrome, when it came out, most of it, the Chromium browser, was open source. People started developing to it, contributing to it, making it better every time, continuously, and uh, every once in a while, Google can grab back some of the code, put it in their browser, 
and bring it to you. Yeah? Uh, Google Chrome is distributed as a binary. Um, and if you look even at the licenses for these icons, yeah, Creative Commons by, you see, CC by, and the BSD license. What do we remember about these two licenses? I actually told you, does anybody remember? No? Okay. When I talked about copyleft, sorry, did you, did you raise your hand? Ah, oh, no, okay. I, it was like this, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. So they're both non-copyleft licenses, yeah? Meaning that it's important for Google to be able to take this code back and if they really want to, make it not free again, yeah? They, they have this freedom, so to say. Um, so this is one of the aspects where, for instance, if you think that we should make freedom viral and make the world free forever, maybe you should think again, yeah? Chromium might not have happened if, uh, if free and open source would have been copyleft mandatory. Canonical, another business which you might not know by this name, but they're the guys which make Ubuntu. Yeah? One of the most popular Linux distributions, much to my chagrin. Um, they're gaining revenue from the solutions which they offer for cluster servers and for enterprises. They're still not profitable in total because they're putting so much money into Ubuntu and Ubuntu for phone, which are not that money making. But you can make money from free and open source software, yeah? Because you can take money for de developing things. In a world in which creativity is not something which happens once every 10 years, you make an innovation when you're in high school, maybe another one and you have your fourth job, but where innovation is something which happens on a daily basis, that's what you should get paid for. And as a company which promotes free and open source software or sells free and open source software, you can say, hey, you guys tell us what you want us to do. We do it, we give the software back to you, you can do whatever you want with it. Other people can improve it and you, you pay us for doing it in the first place. But that's the thing. This works even if the software is not proprietary because the people who have the expertise are the people who can get paid to do amazing things. Another big class of people who benefits from free and open source software are the people who are persecuted. You know? um, due to many of the considerants which I, I, I talked about earlier, uh, Linux is, for instance, free and open source software is, is for instance, very good for privacy. Uh, and Tor, I know how many of you might have heard about this. Who's heard about Tor? Ah, oh, wow. Someone's buying their drugs online. Okay, so... Tor is a, a soft, Tor is practically a, a system which allows you to stay anonymous on the internet. It's very, very good. It was developed by the US Navy, I think, by, by military intelligence, but uh, even they apparently at some point had the idea that it might be a really great idea to give this out to the community and see what happens. And what happened is, um, I mean, you can never be completely anonymous, but Tor is the most anonymous which you can be. And this is great. This is great for whistleblowers. This is great for political activists. This is great for people who want to do what, want to put their ideas forward or want to do whatever they might want to do which is not accepted in their society and not be persecuted for it. Yeah? Think about political activists in oppressive regimes. The regime finds out who you are, they come to your house, they take you, and who knows what happens. If they don't know who you are, then, hmm, well, that's that. Um, also, marginalized political regimes benefit from, from free and open source software. Now, you might not think that these are the good guys, and the next guys, the criminals, are definitely not the good guys, yeah? Because the marginalized political regimes, especially for us in the West, are the people who aren't us, yeah? Um, and they have a problem. Most of the big software companies are here with us. They adhere to our laws, yeah? Even if a software company which lives here in Switzerland or, or in the USA might want to sell their product to, say, North Korea, well, guess what? They're not allowed to because in the moment when you start managing your, soft, uh, your software, your distribution via this legal thing, via this legal system, via copyright and licenses and so on, you're bound to the people who define copyright and licenses and so on, which is the government, yeah? And if they say, well, you guys aren't allowed to do business with this group of people, then you cannot bring your software to them, however much you'd want to, yeah? Whereas free and open source software, it doesn't belong to anybody in particular, it's for everybody, so if someone in North Korea wants to run Windows, uh, wants to run Linux, then uh, if they have access to the outside internet, then yeah, definitely they can run Linux, yeah? Um, and this is not just the case for North Korea, it's probably just the most clear and extreme example, but there's very many, very many countries which cannot be certain that A, they'll get support if they run proprietary software, 
B, that the companies are going to be able to interface with them if they run proprietary software. And for them, free and open source software is, is a great opportunity. Hi. <clears throat> you like criminals? No, okay. Oh, okay. I, I thought you liked criminals. Okay, <laughs> because that's what we're going to talk about next. Yeah. Uh, I talked about uh, about uh, buying drugs online with Tor. Uh, apparently, very many people do this, um, and very many people do a lot of other nasty things with Tor. Yeah. I mean, if you support, if if it's a system which allows whistleblowers to stay anonymous in uh, political activists to stay anonymous in uh, North Korea. It's going to allow people to stay anonymous here as well who do things which our society doesn't deem okay. Sir, you have a question? Yeah, so a lot of anonymous journalists in Germany abroad because they understand that they have a problem with the workers for the last 10 years. Yes, uh, you've probably heard about the sting operations. Like uh, if anybody offers to, to sell drugs online or to do murder for hire online or to sell you child pornography online, a police agent might gain access through Tor because the police is allowed to use Tor as well, might pretend to be a client and they might look for a weakness in this business model yeah, and try to track the money or try to meet the per person in person or try to see when this person responds to their emails. So yeah, definitely, like people can play on this field as well. That's not the issue. The issue is the software, yeah? Because with very many other software infrastructures, the police doesn't need to do a sting operation. They just need to call your ISP and ask, hey guys, whose IP address was this? And they already know, yeah? Getting back to, to these people who do nasty things, I think the fact that they benefit from open source software in the way that people who do wrong things here also get to stay anonymous, and people who do wrong things here and who might be marginalized or might not be able to buy software because like, they can't represent themselves as a company still have access to free and open source software shows another couple of concepts which are really great about free and open source software. The first one is that everyone's invited. Yeah, Everyone's welcome. And it might sound bad when you think that murderers and so on are also invited and they're, they're also welcome, but think about it. Hmm? If you have the infrastructure to deny a product, a service, a freedom to any one person, you have the infrastructure to deny it to anybody. Yeah? So the fact that such a concept is not in place shows that whatever else might be going on, you can be reliant that your freedom to benefit from this development of technology, just like your freedom to benefit from science, will stay intact no matter how you might be branded or what you might do. Yeah? The busy and the creative, yeah? Like criminals everybody hates, but us, everybody loves, right? Um, as I told you, Linux can teach you, okay, free and open source software can teach you to use software to your empowerment in a way which you want, yeah? To learn to make the computer work for you outside of the bounding boxes of user interfaces or whatever, yeah? And this is valuable. This is valuable for students. This is valuable for scientists. This is valuable for engineers analysts and artists, and I'm pretty sure every single one of you is a student now and might be one of these other four things in a while. Yeah? Uh, as a scientist or as an engineer, ask yourself, what are the odds that at some point in my career I will want to do something which hasn't occurred to anybody before? If you want to be a good scientist or, or a good engineer, that's definitely going to happen, not once, not, not twice, but on a regular basis. And if you don't have the software infrastructure which allows you to use the computer, this incredibly powerful object which for so many people, for data analysts, for scientists, has become almost an extension of their mind, so to say, with which they interpret data and look at things. If you don't have control over this, if you can't make this do things which were not in the mind of the user interface designer, yeah, then that's certainly a big minus for your science or engineering career. And you should think about that. Um, using free and open source software gives you the opportunity to learn the right way to do stuff. I talked about good software habits, learning from the nerds, because these are the computer people, and if you're going to work with a computer, they probably have the best ideas. So it gives you the opportunity to learn from them, to learn the right way of doing it. Yeah? But it also allows you to keep the freedom to, in the end, do stuff your way. Yeah? Because the, the, the people who talk to you in the Ubuntu or Gentoo IRC or mailing list, yeah, 
uh, sure, they can tell you what's like the right way, the soft, the computer science, this soft sound way of doing it. But it's not like the user interface designer. You're not bound to this way. You listen, you take it on board, and then it's your computer. You can do whatever you want with it. Yeah? Okay. Most of all, you. I told you, your students can learn to do great, amazing things. You might want to become scientists, engineers. Some of you might not, but up until that point, you're still going to want to study, find out more about the world, maybe look at it through this extension of your mind in a way which didn't occur to the designers of Mathematica. And the sooner you start working on this, the better. Yeah? It's not that hard. You can learn how to use Linux for less effort than it takes you to get one credit point. And I can guarantee that's going to be like the most valuable 0 0.8 credit points from your entire study. And the good thing about this is you've already started. Yeah? How much time has passed? Uh, I think an hour or something like that? You already know a lot more about free and open source software than, uh, than very many people. Probably still a lot less than you should. But you started listening to this. And um, if you're going to walk out of here and say, OK, that was nice, bye, it was a history lesson which I could have given you in 20 minutes. Yeah? It would have been like 40 minutes of wasted time. But if you say, OK, this is valuable. I might be someone who's creative, who wants to use the computer in a way which did not occur to interface designers. I am someone who might someday be persecuted. Yeah? I am someone who might someday want to find out something about the world, how to solve a problem on the computer, and leave this solution in a way which will be valuable for so many generations to come. You might be that person. I think most certainly many of you are that people, th those kind of people. And um, if you do pursue Linux in the following Linux days, or just by doing your own research on the internet, then it's definitely not 40 wasted, min wasted minutes. Yeah, It's definitely something which will help you for a very, very long time to come. So this is about it. We're going to have a short question and answer round. I don't know, is any time left from how long we booked the room? Yeah. And after that, uh, you can join us, meaning me, and the lovely people in the back for a beer at the BQM. I don't know exactly where that is, but I'm sure my dear colleagues will show me. Uh, and you can come to the next Linux Days events, which you will find online under this link. Or if it's too long to memorize by heart, you have it here, or you can go under the alternative.ch and, uh, and browse to this link. Um, and you can join the Hacking Album. This is going to be ha uh, happening at, uh, at 5 o'clock on Thursday, October, October 29th, right? at the Thursday beer in the CHN. I also don't really know where that is, but I'm sure you can find it on the internet. At the Hacking Album, if in the time from now to there, you've listened to the rest of the Linux Days presentations, or if you've done your own research, or if you've downloaded uh, Ubuntu or Gentoo or whatever else, and you've installed it on your system, and you don't understand something about it, you can come there, you can ask your questions, you can say, you know that guy, the first presentation, he lied to us, this is not working. And we're going to help you solve your problems. Okay, it's that great support I was talking about. So this is about it, and thanks so much for listening.